I've uh, decided to talk about uh, the urban poor, basically because of uh, some of the experiences I've had working in Africa and working particularly in some of the poorest uh, areas uh, in the slum communities. So I start off by uh, just uh, highlighting the problem as I see it, and then later on I'll tell you about some of uh, the motivations, how I got into doing this uh, type of research. So the biggest problem uh, I think we are having in the African cities is uh, one, uh, rural to urban migration, but also accompanied by natural population growth in the cities because uh, fertility is quite high. But this is leading to large population increases in the cities and in the towns. But unfortunately, housing and social services, they're not keeping up with the uh, population increase. So you have a situation of uh, large overcrowding, very poor sanitation, no garbage disposal systems, no sewage systems. And then accompanying that, you have uh, in insecurity and particularly you know, women and, and young girls vulnerable to sexual violence and things like that. So there's quite a, a, a lot of uh, risk taking uh, health wise, so for example, uh, sexual uh, risk taking. Uh, resulting into poor health. But then you've also got issues to do with infectious diseases, uh, diarrhea and the likes. With any migration, you have to think of um, the things that push people as well as uh, pull people. So some of the push factors in the rural communities of Africa, it's, it's a hard life. And uh, you're looking at uh, huge population pressure brought about by high fertility levels in the, in the rural communities. And you're also looking at uh, real poverty in the rural communities. So the thought of going into the cities is always attractive for rural people who are facing hardship and having to uh, make a living out of uh, maybe cultivating the soil or cutting down trees and the like. So usually they're going into the cities in search of a better life. And I've got a picture there where essentially you're looking at a quite well-planned city. This is a picture from a, a, a long time ago, one of the cities, it might be Nairobi. But essentially the thought is a, a city where everything is nicely planned. You have a better housing, you have a schools, and social services, healthcare, Etc. And these are some of the reasons that people give when you ask why they migrated, say, from villages to, to the urban centers. And in, in some places, in some uh, cases, they also talk about uh, being able to have funding to help uh, the rest of the family back uh, home in the rural communities. The reality is often, I, I don't know if you can see the pictures as, as well there, but the reality is often overcrowding and uh, uh, the left-hand corner there is a picture of Akibera, one of the larger uh, slum communities in Africa that's in Kenya. And you have situations where, you know, essentially there are no toilet facilities. As I said, no garbage disposal, people are just throwing rubbish about. So that's a situation that most people who are migrating from rural areas into the cities find themselves in. So what I would like her to now do is just to say a little bit about what got me started to start looking at uh, intra-urban health. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the growth of uh, urban population in Africa. And then I've got uh, three examples that I would like to illustrate uh, looking at the health of the urban poor. One is to do with uh, maternal health, so looking at motherhood. Another one is to look at child survival in, in uh, cities. And then the last example I have is uh, looking at HIV infection. Being a, a social scientist and demographer and statistician, my sort of uh, research areas are very eclectic because I, I'm attracted by numbers and being able to look at patterns. So I, I dabble in a lot of things. So that's a, a reflection of my research and my life. I'll finish off by just saying a little bit about uh, some of interventions and challenges that uh, uh, a face in doing that. So what got me started, as I said, uh, I'm a number cruncher and uh, I was actually looking at data from Zambia 
So we're looking at uh, around uh, 98, 97, 98. I was looking at data from Zambia and looking at child survival with those data. And I knew that uh, Zambia had been going through quite a difficult economic um, environment. And I did wonder whether you know, that was actually being reflected, for example, amongst uh, the urban poor. Because at, up to that point, my uh, way of thinking about poverty was uh, rural poverty. I never really thought so much about uh, people in the cities and facing hardship. But I did some analysis and found this um, interesting interaction where I was looking at uh, two groups, uh, urban children and rural children, but then I uh, cross-classified looking at household wealth, looking at those with low wealth in the city and in, urban, uh, in rural areas, medium wealth and high wealth. And what I found was that uh, the ones in urban areas who had low wealth or the so low socioeconomic group, they had the highest um, uh, rate of uh, um, infant mortality, much higher than even the rural poor. So that's what got me started in thinking about uh, the intra-urban uh, uh, situation and being able to segment uh, the population that way. The rest of the world is perhaps more urban than poor, uh, than, uh, more urban than rural, but uh, Africa is still uh, lower, uh, has a lower rate of urbanization compared to, say, um, Asia or, or Europe. So the urbanization rate for Africa is around 37%, although the projections by the UN are that uh, by about 2030, the uh, African population will be half urban and half rural. So the diagram there just showing you where the cutoff is likely to be around 2030. At the moment, still more rural people than they are urban. The rate of growth is uh, quite high, so the average rate of growth is around 1.4% for sub-Saharan Africa, so south of the Sahara, excluding uh, countries like Egypt, Morocco, etc. I think only countries like Zimbabwe have negative uh, urban uh, population growth, uh, annual population growth, where people are migrating out of the cities, but the rest of the countries have positive uh, uh, annual uh, growth rate. And in some countries like Rwanda, you're looking at close to 4% annual growth rate. So take an example of Nigeria, where the urban uh, uh, growth rate is about 1.9%, uh, nearly 2%. And a city like Lagos, with uh, more than 17 million people, every year you're having more than 333,000 people into the city. So that's a big uh, you know, people movement. Uh, uh, being added to the city every time. And just to stress again that it's not all uh, migration from the rural areas, but you're also having people who are in the city who are having uh, children and contributing to population growth that way. So insufficient housing, insufficient facilities, and sanitation. Just to give an example, this is a, a map I took from uh, the UN um, uh, website, just showing... Um, the uh, proportion of uh, the urban population that actually reside in slum communities. So the red are the, essentially the slum uh, uh, dwellers, and then the uh, yellow colored are the non-slum dwellers. And then the size of the bubble is reflective of uh, the population size. So the smaller the, the circle or the bubble, the, the smaller the sample size. But as you can see, there are a lot of reds there. So a lot of people actually in urban areas are living in slum conditions. Okay. The UN Habitat has a definition of, uh, of slums, but it's, uh, it's sort of like um, quite um, uh, a loose uh, uh, definition because if you just don't have, for example, if you don't have a toilet uh, that's uh, uh, yeah, within the household, if you don't have uh, a security of tenure, any one of those, if you don't have access to water, etc., then you're defined as slums. So countries like, for example, Ethiopia, uh, nearly everybody who's in urban areas is considered as living in slums when we know that that's actually not the case. So the definition perhaps needs a, a little bit of, of working there. 
Okay, so the first example I have, uh, which is um, motherhood or maternal health, and I start off by arguing that it's really a balancing act, and it's not just uh, in urban areas, but I, I see motherhood as being quite a challenge in, in um, most of Africa. So pregnancy is not always a joyful occasion. There are a large number of uh, women who actually would like to um, delay or stop childbearing who actually are unable to do so. So when you think about the proportion of women who actually don't have access to contraception when they would like to uh, delay childbearing or prevent it, you're looking at uh, close to a quarter of women. So a third of the pregnancies are unintended. And the, the consequences of that are that sometimes women, you know, don't use uh, uh, antenatal services, don't use uh, proper delivery facilities for various reasons. Sometimes they're sort of like trying to ignore the fact that they're pregnant or indeed they're in a place where this is quite difficult. It's quite difficult to get the services. So quite a large number of women facing death and their children also at risk of dying. Uh, as an illustration, just to show the severity of, uh, say, maternal uh, mortality in Africa compared with the rest of the world, um, an African woman from sub-Saharan Africa has one in 16 chances of uh, dying you know, as a maternal death, bearing in mind also the fact that they have high fertility, so the chances of dying are actually magnified because it's not just a once or twice. Some of them are having four or five some even seven, eight children. Compared to South Asia, we're looking at one in 43 and then about one in 4,000 in industrialized countries like the UK, Sweden, and the like. So um, between 2004 and 2007, I, I took um, a sabbatical and went to work in um, Nairobi with the African Population and Health Research Center, which is a, a Pan-African Research Institute that uh, focuses on doing uh, urban research. So they have a surveillance system and uh, they collect data in the slums and uh, demonstrate the, the plight of uh, slum dwellers to policymakers and the like. So we had funding from the World Bank and also Wellcome Trust to look at maternal health in two slums in Nairobi city. And we're interested in looking at barriers to institutional deliveries, but also trying to understand the causes of maternal death in the slums. And then the third thing we're interested in looking at is uh, the health facilities and their preparedness for emergency care. <laughs> So just a little bit about uh, the surveillance system that the African Population and Health Research uh, Center does. They actually have surveillance for about 60,000 people in two slums. And the area, the geographical area is quite small. We're looking at, um, you know, not uh, far off from about one square kilometer with uh, lots of people uh, staying in those areas. And their quarterly visits to the houses and every quarter you go and uh, record who's coming, who's gone out, any children who have been born. And if there is a death, uh, then uh, you do uh, a ver verbal autopsy. I'll say a little bit about that. One of the slums has about 74% of the inhabitants who are migrants, and the other one is quite a migrant uh, uh, population. 95% of the people there are migrants. The majority of the migrants are from rural areas, uh, and the, the remaining are migrating from one slum to another, and some of them are, for example, refugees from Rwanda who've come and settled there, or from the Sudan. The majority of our people migrate as uh, teenagers, in 15s, 16s, 18s, 19s, all young adults. So it's, it's quite rare to see people migrating into the slums ages of 40, 50, etc. usually they tend to be quite young. And uh, employment is um, a, a problem. About 14% of the population under surveillance are actually in salaried employment. So majority actually are doing you know, casual work or self-employment. Self Just to give you a, a, a picture, that's a, a population pyramid for the two slums. 
And what the, the uh, pyramid shows essentially is what I've been talking about, the fact that you've got in-migration at uh, younger ages, uh, working ages around, say, 20, 20, 24, all the way up to about uh, uh, 30, 30 to 34. And then you also have uh, absence of the older generation because people, when they've retired, they tend to migrate out of the slums, usually back to, to their villages. Okay, so with the maternal health uh, studies that we were doing, when we identify, say, a day uh, that a person has died in the community, and if they are a woman of reproductive age or a young girl, then verbal autopsies would be done. In fact, verbal autopsies are done for any death, so even with males and uh, etc., trying to identify the probable uh, cause of, of death. And usually it's two medically qualified people, and if there's disagreement, you have a third person to sort of like uh, uh, confirm. With the uh, female deaths, we decided to examine again all the maternal, uh, all the deaths uh, between 2003 and five, just to check if they'd been missed as maternal deaths, because with the definition of maternal death, it's quite broad. You're looking at uh, you know a death to a woman who's either pregnant or you know, immediately after birth, uh, after the birth of the child, up to about uh, six weeks. And sometimes it's easy to miss some of these pregnancies if they've just died suddenly in, preg uh, in pregnancy, it's, it's possible to miss the deaths. So we reviewed uh, the, the female deaths aged 15 to 49. We also interviewed women who'd recently given birth just to find out about their experiences of uh, giving birth and where they'd given birth so that we could actually identify the facilities where women were giving birth. So when we looked at the um, maternal deaths, we actually found that uh, in the slums, maternal mortality was about 25% higher compared with the rest of Kenya. So there were roughly about uh, 290 deaths to women, of, of which 10 were maternal deaths, 10% were maternal deaths, i.e. 29 deaths. There were some late maternal deaths, women who died after the six weeks, but then you know they were not uh, classified as maternal deaths, but could have been maternal deaths, just that their, their deaths were delayed outside the cutoff uh, period. So about 606 deaths per 100,000 uh, live births was what we estimated as maternal mortality rate in the slums, and the national rate was about 560 just showing you know, quite a, a large difference. And during the survey that we did, interviewing the nearly 5,000 women, about 70% of them reported that they'd delivered in an uh, uh, institutional delivery, i.e. at a health facility or a hospital. But then when we actually went out to, to see these facilities, we found that quite a large number of these facilities were actually not health facilities. One, they were not registered, and most of them were like a business. So person, you know, with just basic, you know, information about health, bought a white coat, was called a doctor, and then they, they provided, uh, you know, maternity services. So the real percentage of true uh, institutional deliveries, we estimated to be about 48%, rather than the 70 that we'd been told. And then in terms of what the women were dying of, the health facilities that we actually visited, there were about 25 of them, there were the facilities that the women in the slums had said they delivered at, and two of them were large uh, hospitals owned by the state, Kenyatta and also Pumwani, which is a specialist maternity uh, clinic. And some of them were registered small uh, facilities registered by the Minister of Health, the rest were sort of like, uh, as I said, uh, businesses. So when we're looking at the health facility data, we're looking at uh, records that actually were in the facility and some of the women were not slum women. And then with the community data, this is data that we actually uh, looked at using the verbal autopsies to try and establish the cause of death. Okay. So just a, a bit of a comparison, we found that uh, with the community data, we were able to identify about 30, 31% of the deaths being attributed to abortion-related uh, complications. 
And when you take on, uh, into account the fact that abortion is uh, legally re restricted in Kenya, it's not surprising when you get to the health facility and you find that it's only a very small percentage, about 7% of the deaths called uh, uh, abortion related. But working in the slums, you know, there was no doubt in my mind that there were a lot of uh, abortions that were actually taking place you know, illegally within the communities and the complications that sometimes lead to death. So, and again, also for example, in um, the communities we identified about 14% of the deaths being related to HIV um, complications or HIV uh, uh, morbidity, while as uh, in the health facility, it was only about uh, uh, 3%. So just again, to emphasize that the, the people in the health facility or the, the statistics there relate to more than the slum community while as the community data were just uh, the women that uh, were identified in the slums. But essentially, there's quite a lot of uh, deaths that are happening uh, through infection or hemorrhage um, and uh, preventable uh, conditions, I should say. Okay, in terms of uh, preparedness for emergency obstetric care, of the 25 facilities, Two, as I said, were outside of the um, slums and they were owned by government. And we looked at uh, staffing, we looked at the procedures performed, we looked at the equipment, and the supplies, the referral system, also looked at the health management information system. And only two, the uh, government hospitals, met the criteria for comprehensive emergency obstetric care. Most provided less than basic care. So when we use uh, the... Um, uh, basic care, you know, criteria, you know, majority of the facilities didn't even meet that. So essentially, we are in a situation where, you know, all, all, all these poor women are actually going into facilities where when something is wrong, you know, there isn't really the support or the, the care to, to help them. So next I move on to uh, children. So what about children? So I'm use, using uh, the slum uh, inhabitants and rural urban migrants sometimes interchangeably, but I know that sometimes the slum mig uh, inhabitants have been there for a long period of time. But the slums are the first destination of uh, the rural urban migrants. And in doing this work, we actually looked at a number of data sets. We were interested in looking at... Um, say, uh, urban advantage of children in Africa using data from many African countries, but we're also using the Nairobi slums as a case study just to look at what was happening to the slum children compared to children outside of the slums. So the first uh, study there was a study that uh, I conducted with two colleagues. Uh, it took a long time because it was unfunded, so it took five years to do because Essentially, we worked on the paper every time we met at the conference. So that's not a way to do uh, a paper, but uh, I would like to think that it ended up being a, a three-star, at least, paper uh, for REF. Anyway, the data came from 18 countries in the 90s. Again, because uh, we started it a long time ago, that's why it uh, uh, ordered data. But looking at the data, and these are national representative data from 18 African countries, migration is quite high in uh, the rest of Africa. It's not just in Nairobi, we're talking about uh, most of Africa. And it's not even just you know, urban rural migration, there's also quite a lot of rural to rural migration. People move a lot. So 35% of the urban mothers lived in rural areas before. And 26% of the mothers in the com rural communities had also lived in urban areas before. And there was quite a lot of migration within rural communities and urban communities. And some of the migration was happening during childbearing years. So it wasn't just uh, the rural to urban, younger, and then urban to rural order. Some of the uh, migration was happening during childbearing years. And we're interested in the uh, uh, movement of the women bearing in mind the fact that the, usually the under five children co-reside with their mother. So if the women were moving from one location to another, we took it that uh, the children were moving alongside with them. Countries like Gabon with uh, quite high uh, 
movement of people into the city for temporary work and then going back to the rural areas, you have uh, quite a large proportion of children who live away from the mothers. So in the um, national surveys, and these are demographic and health surveys that um, are conducted uh, in most of the African countries and Asian countries and Latin America almost once every five years, you do have some nice questions that can help you reconstruct uh, where people were at times when deaths were occurring. So there are questions like, have you been, how long have you been living continuously in this place of residence, whether it's a rural or urban area? And also questions like, just before you moved into the city, where did you stay? Were you in a rural area? Were you in a town? Were you in a countryside, etc.? Using these two questions, we're able to identify four groups of, uh, of women and their children, those who'd always lived in urban areas, those who always lived in rural areas, those who'd migrated from urban to rural areas, and those who'd migrated from rural to urban areas. But in addition, we could also look at uh, mortality experiences of families before they migrated. So during the time they were in rural areas before moving into urban areas. And once they moved into urban areas, what was uh, the mortality experience for their children? So just uh, starting off by comparing um, rural to urban migrants, comparing them with those who never moved. So comparing them with uh, uh, rural inhabitants who'd never moved. We're using under five mortality rate, which is the death to children uh, uh, before the birth of before the fifth birthday, out of every one thousand live births. So, on average, rural to urban migrants for these eighteen countries, you can see that before migration, their the mortality rate was about one hundred and seventy deaths to under five children for every one thousand comparing it to 176 for the non-migrants. So essentially, you're looking at a situation where the migrants were healthier compared to the non-migrants before they even moved, which uh, uh, supports uh, the hypothesis that migrants tend to be a select uh, group. They're usually healthier. Sometimes they are more educated compared to those who never move. But then when you look at, at uh, the country-specific analysis, essentially you're looking at 18, uh, 11 out of the 18 countries where the results were statistically significant. So just to give an example of Benin, Benin, uh, uh, under five mortality for the migrants before they moved was 114 compared to people who never moved in the rural communities and 182. So quite a big difference there. And then following these same um, families, when they actually move into the rural, uh, into the urban areas, into the cities, so what happens to them? So essentially we found a generally lower under five mortality after migration. So 122 compared to uh, before migrating, 117. But it, uh, you know, when you're looking at country by country analysis, we only uh, saw significance in six out of the 18 countries. Okay. So there was uh, the general direction was that uh, under five mortality was lower when people moved into the city compared to before they moved, but it wasn't significant in all of the countries. And then the other comparison is looking at um, the migrants into the cities compared with the people who've always lived in the city. So on average, we found that the uh, rural to urban migrants, after they'd migrated, their mortality, uh, under five mortality rate was 121, compared to 116 for the urban non-migrants. So slightly higher under five mortality for those who are moving into the city compared with those who'd always lived in the city. However, this was a, um, there was a mixed picture. So in some countries, we found that you know, migrant children fared worse than non-migrants in the cities. In some countries, only for about four, migrant children fared better than the um, non-migrants. And then in six countries, there was no difference. Again, it really depends on the settings because um, sometimes people are moving into the city and this, the situation in the city is not as bad as, for example, 
in the Nairobi slums who have shown you pictures, and then you find that uh, you know the migrant children actually you know coming into a place where they're already healthier and they're doing well compared to non-migrants. In some cases, it's worse than um, the inhabitants. And then the other group which is interesting is uh, people who are actually moving from urban to rural areas. And bearing in mind that we're looking at under five mortality, so you're looking at families who are still in their childbearing ages. And we had to think about who actually moves from cities to the rural areas before they're old, i.e. in the childbearing ages. And our thinking was that these are people who've actually failed to make it in the cities. They're usually poor and then are actually escaping something in the city or escaping poverty in the city. So urban to rural migrants, before they migrate, you know, we found under five mortality was about 162 compared to 116 for non-migrants. So those families who are migrating from urban to rural areas actually have higher mortality than the people who are you know, staying in urban areas, non-movers. Okay, so it's a sort of like a, a select group with poorer health conditions who are moving out. And after migration, their mortality was sort of like slightly lower, 160 compared to 162, but not, uh, you know, statistically significant in majority of the countries. So there was an, a picture of uh, improvement in child survival when these urban to rural migrants move, you know, compared to when they were in the city. But the sample sizes we're dealing with were quite small. So not a lot of people move out of the cities back into the villages. But of those who do, they tend to be people with poor uh, 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 circumstances, uh, economically as well as poor health. OK. Working at the African and Population and Health Center, we, we had an opportunity to actually do a cross-sectional slum survey. So instead of just uh, looking at the two slums in Nairobi City, we're also able to actually do a survey in uh, seven or eight uh, other slums in the city to actually calibrate uh, the surveillance that we're doing. But that also gave us the opportunity to be able to look at some indicators at uh, a much bigger scale. So the data that uh, we were able to collect, we actually could make comparisons. So the, the graph I have there is uh, just to show the under five mortality of children in the slums compared to the rest of, of Kenya. So we have uh, on the extreme right there, we have uh, the slum children, and then we've got uh, in the middle Nairobi city and urban area, and then the rural areas. So for rural areas, urban areas, Nairobi city, we were using national representative data that collects information for, for each province, for Nairobi, as well as for the rural areas. And we were able to calculate under five mortality rates for different periods in time. And making the comparison there, you can see that uh, in the urban, uh, in the Nairobi slums, you're looking at quite high um, under five mortality compared to um, the rest of, of Kenya. So to start with before um, the 1990s, in the slum community in, in Nairobi, under five mortality was slightly lower than in the rural areas. So those are the blue bars for Nairobi slums compared to um, rural areas. But then over time, you're seeing a situation where in the slums, mortality tended to be quite high. So around uh, the 1995 period, which is a time when I think there was quite a lot of uh, immigration into uh, Nairobi city, a lot of uh, um, uh, in inhabitable conditions that people were living in, under five mortality was quite high. So by doing this analysis, we were able to document and show, especially to the Kenya government, how the situation of the urban poor was um, uh, panning out. We did get uh, some, um, you know, funding, for example, to help. Uh, I remember once we got money from the Norwegian government and the Danish government to erect toilets and to have showers in the in the communities, but there were also challenges with, uh, uh, you know, those interventions. I'll finish off with that uh, in a few minutes.
just to say how it, how difficult it was to put up toilets and showers in the communities. Final example is um, HIV AIDS. And the reason why uh, we came to doing HIV um, testing in the slums, two things. Uh, first of all, some of my colleagues at the African Population and Health Research Center actually documented quite a high sexual risk, risk taking amongst the slum residents, particularly early sexual debut with uh, children starting uh, uh, having sex at quite early ages and quite a lot of uh, sexual uh, uh, sexualization is the word I want to use. Quite a lot of that, sometimes because of uh, the proximity, the way people live, mother, father, and the children, they stay in the same room, they sleep in the same room. It's quite difficult to have uh, you know, privacy for the family, uh, for, the, for the parents with the children around there. But then also amongst the married women, there was quite a, a lot of um, um, partner exchanges, sometimes happening as a way of uh, earning additional money to help with the children. So married women in the slums, they were three times more likely to have multiple partners compared to, for example, rural women who were married. So all these things made us think about um, looking and trying to understand how such a risky sexual behavior was uh, influencing or you know, affecting HIV uh, situation in the slums. And the second thing was that um, everybody that we were talking to about uh, the situation in terms of health and all that, they kept saying, oh, you've got to look at HIV and AIDS because that's a confounder. Everything you look at, you've got to think about HIV AIDS. And then people were just plucking number from, numbers from the air and saying, oh, it's 50%, it's 70%. So we thought, you know, why not just do a proper study and find out what's happening? And we got funding from Rockefeller Foundation and also Wellcome Trust to just do um, a, a, a simple prevalence study. The fact that we had a surveillance system meant that um, we could actually take a, a random sample of uh, men and women and actually do testing. So we were not able to find all the, all the people that we wanted. We found about 72% of our random sample for women, and of, of those, 77 accepted to have the test. For the men, they were a bit more elusive, I suppose because uh, you know, most of the times they were out working. We were able to contact about 67% of the men, of whom 79% uh, accepted to have the test. And then what we did was then to compare the results when we got them with the overall Kenya um, data from the demographic and health surveillance, uh, demographic and health service, where they'd also tested about 7,000 women across the country. And they had uh, about 72% uh, rural people, about 6% uh, from the uh, demographic and health surveillance were from the slums we worked out. So HIV testing. And the results, as we expected, we found that you know, in the slums, HIV was a lot higher than, say, in non-slums in the cities, as well as in the rural areas. So for example, for women, we're looking at uh, more than double the uh, national rate. So national rate was around 6%. For women, we're looking at about 13% of the women in the slums aged 15 uh, 49 were HIV positive. So we're looking at about 2006 to 2007. That's when we, we did the study. And then also similarly for men, there was a quite higher um, HIV prevalence compared to men in non-slum areas as well as in rural areas. So this was the first study that actually did a prevalence study uh, in slum communities and we were able to document the um, uh, much higher prevalence compared to the rest of the city. So it's not easy to unpack what is um, uh, the reason for such a high HIV prevalence in the slums, but it's sorry, it's not all about um, uh, wealth status because after you account for the place of residence, we didn't find an association with wealth, HIV status and wealth, we didn't find it. 
no, with highest education. Sometimes people have said, okay, the wealthier, they are more likely to be HIV positive. But once we'd controlled for a place of residence, we couldn't find that. But we did find a, a strong link with uh, things like uh, ethnicity. Um, in, in Kenya, you know, there are different ethnic groups with different cultural practices, and uh, that was also shown in our results. And also with um, when, especially girls, when they had their first sex, so early sexual debut was linked to high H HIV preference. So mm -hmm. that's just a, a graph showing you the odds of uh, being HIV positive by age at first sex with those who were 20, had sex at 20 years or older, much lower uh, preference compared to those who had sex before 15 years. There was a small percentage of, of uh, teenagers who had never had sex but who were HIV positive, presumably some of them from mother to child uh, transmission. Okay, so finally, I, I just wanted to talk a little bit about interventions and also talk about uh, the challenges. I start off by, I've got two, two, two slides here. I start off by just talking about what we know works in the slum. So I, I don't see this as um, something we need to do research about. So things like governance in the slums and things about provision of infrastructure, I see them as given. You only have to look at the situation to see that you do need to improve the lives of people there. So one example is a slum upgrading where you know governments and you know their development partners are helping in terms of doing slum upgrading. The challenges there are that you know sometimes there's no consultation with uh, residents of uh, the communities. So you find actually people accepting the houses and then they put tenants in the houses, they go back to their original shots and then you know, they're getting money out of them. And then this is also a true story. I, I was driving one time, we were with a colleagues driving in Pumalanga in South Africa to, to go to a surveillance site in rural South Africa. And we drove and I found, uh, you know, by a hill, lots of toilets. And I didn't know there were toilets, but uh, asking the driver, I said there were toilets. They were just lots of toilets by the hillside. And I was like, how strange, why are there the toilets? Where are the houses? And we drove about 10 minutes and found the houses. So uh, that's just an example of uh, you know, where you know, there's no consultation, government is trying to help, they build these houses, but then the toilets are you know, half a, a, an, hour, an, an hour's walk to actually get to the facilities. The other thing is that the issue of security of tenure to uh, prevent evictions. A lot of the slum people, uh, uh, they actually have no tenure. And sometimes they come and build houses where they are not supposed to be houses. So the land belongs to other people. And sometimes also people are taking advantage of the fact that they are poor, they have nowhere to go. You know, they're charged exorbitant prices and then they, they get evicted very easily. And the provision of services, water, toilets, etc. these are important. The challenges we found was that um, we got money to actually build toilets, we got money to build um, uh, some showers, but then we couldn't find land where we could actually put these uh, facilities because no one really owned this land. You know, it probably belonged to the government or the city, and nobody would give permission, but then also, once we found land that uh, the chiefs within the slums were able to provide, people were reluctant to have the facilities near the chiefs' places. So there was a lot of uh, going backwards and forwards where you have the facilities and the money to help build toilets, but there's a lot of uh, going on where people are reluctant to allow the facilities to take place there. We also had this um, naive idea that I uh, would have uh, this as a business for women where they could charge the inhabitants to actually you know, use the facilities. But then within their own slums, they, they, they decided that wasn't what they wanted. So eventually they ended up giving the facilities to youth who then use the facilities to charge people to use them. And then they use the money for school fees and things like that. So lots of issues that uh, 
you know, come about with, uh, you know, some interventions. And finally, uh, we've been doing some um, uh, interventions essentially in terms of um, promoting healthy behavior. So a, a number of things that are happening in the slums, one is happening with uh, help of uh, the German government and others, which is uh, reproductive health vouchers, where essentially women buy a voucher at a very low cost, but then the voucher, voucher enables them to actually get either you know, contraceptives or to use for you know, delivery when they need to. So these vouchers are seen as quite important, but they're actually operating on a small scale. It's quite difficult to imagine providing vouchers to millions of, of people in the slums. And um, a paper by Jessica Ameda from the African Population and Health Center shows in the Nairobi slums, there seems to be some positive effect in terms of use of maternity services, but it's not really as large. So for the subsequent childbearing, once a woman has had a child, the next child, there's some positive effect in terms of use of uh, maternity services. And then we've also just finished our work where we've been working with community health workers who've been giving counseling to pregnant women, and, you know, counseling them until their babies are about a year old to promote exclusive breastfeeding. And the results are, we're just analyzing them essentially. We started off from a baseline of about 2% of the children who were exclusively breastfed. And the results suggest that uh, the prevalence has gone up to 50% in the intervention group, but so has in the control group. So we, we don't really know whether it's our intervention or something else has been hap happening outside that. So we're still trying to unpack that. But we did identify the challenges of actually doing something like this, promoting exclusive breastfeeding in a place of abject poverty where women don't have maternity benefit. Essentially, they are working on a daily basis and if they actually stay home to breastfeed, that means uh, that uh, a day's wage uh, lost. And the challenge is there, we, we just discovered that we can't just bring a, a, a promotion, a health promotion you know, intervention like that without thinking about the economics of uh, living in the uh, slums. So quite a lot of challenges that we identified. So I just want to thank you for your uh, audience and for listening.